Hello and welcome to The Old Garage. This is number two. Well, yeah, I got that far. <laughs> Did have a few questions. Uh, you know, I mean, I have less than 200 subscribers, so I'm not exactly getting bombarded yet, but hopefully that'll change. So let's go ahead and take a look at the questions that we have. These are coming from the episodes on uh, Panhard and Levisor, which is number five, and the episode on Didier en Bouton, which is number six. So here we go. First one is by a gentleman, I assume, I don't know, but the name is E, the letter E. I mean, like men in black, you know, they're in, you know, he's, he's got to be one of them because, uh, or she, I don't know. I mean, they're, uh, you know, it, it, you got K, you got J, you got Z, you got D, you know, they're all named after letters. And so I, I, I realized that, you know, this guy won't let me remember. Okay. But anywho, um, he posts um, the following. My question, I have no question, but thanks for the relaxing content. You're welcome. Now, Coltax100 has posed the following regarding Panhard and Levisor. Said You said that Panhard and Levisor changed the thing with engine in the back, and I know most cars in our modern times have their engines in the front, but why was it in the back? And second, weren't there cars long after Panhard and Levisor that changed it, that still had engines in the back? Was it like the steering wheel where some countries have it on the left, another on the right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Steering wheel thing I will get into. All right, just, yeah, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you, the thing that you have to remember is that in the 19th century, Things that right now you absolutely take for granted about cars were not taken for granted. It was a very different time. For example, how many wheels should a car have? Should it have three? Should it have four? Should it have five? Should it have six? You know, should it be one in the front, two in the back? One in the back and two in the front? Should it be one on each corner? Should there be four of them, but one in the back, one in the front, and two on each side? You know, these things hadn't necessarily been worked out yet. And, you know, steering wheel, I mean, yeah, you take it for granted, but was that the right way to do it? They tried steering wheels, they tried steering levers, they tried steering tillers. I mean, there was even uh, companies that even tried uh, uh, foot steering with pedals, you know. Um, do they have windshield? Well, windshields, you know, who, who thought of that, you know? Cars didn't necessarily even have doors, <laughs> okay? There's just so many different aspects of a car that... Uh, you know, were still very much experimental because cars were very young. And that's why when I said that Panhard and Levistor made, you know, that particular layout, it was because they put the engine in the front with the transmission behind that, although transaxles, you know, did come about. But nonetheless, it was engine to the front, driving wheels to the rear. And once you get much past 1900, you know, with some exceptions, of course, through to the 1980s, you, that was how cars were built because it was simply easier. It was more simple to mass produce a car, uh, to, uh, to make a chassis, you know, all with the technology, make a chassis, put an engine on it, put a body on it, and out the door you go. Um, and, and there's going to be a lot that's going to be discussed about that uh, on the channel. Uh, obviously, there were exceptions. Uh, Oster Daimler you know, had uh, Ferdinand Porsche uh, that very much was into rear engine cars. Uh, at the same time, you had Nesselsdorfer, uh, which eventually became Tatra, where you had Hans Ledwinka also doing a lot of rear engine cars. You had uh, Walter Christie, you know, in 1904 making front engine cars. Heck, you had Spiker in 1904 in, in the Netherlands making four wheel drive cars. So it's, it's not that that was exclusive, but once, you know, the very basic kinks of what made a car got worked out, you know, that's just the direction that most manufacturers went. So, uh, I hope that answers the question. Let's uh, go on to the next one. Um, Tom Mills Vlog, uh, he posed the question, 
regarding De Dion uh, Bhutan. It says, when you're talking about De Dion Bhutan being the biggest automobile manufacturers of their time, what kind of output are we talking about here? Uh, I can't imagine that there would be too many potential buyers around 1900, even though the More Money Than Sense Club was probably enjoying brisk membership increases at the time. Boy, would you be surprised. Uh, by the year 1900, actually before the year 1900, by the end of 1899, there were 383 different companies that had manufactured automobiles in the world uh, from all over the place. I mean, Europe, uh, Britain, America, Canada, Australia, Mexico. Uh, I, I mean, there was a lot going on. And although uh, Carl Benz was building cars, Carl Benz also was building engines, proprietary engines, you know, for sale, you know, or licensed to build. And, and they were building, you know, you know, with the Victoria and the Comfort and others, I mean, they were pumping out almost a thousand cars a year by 1900. Uh, that's where Dédion Bouton actually took the record, uh, took it from them. Uh, you, they, they actually manufactured a little over 1,100 cars, uh, plus they were building engines. Uh, for applications by anybody who wanted to get an engine and they built over 10,000 engines just in 1900 alone and What they were selling their engines for they didn't care I mean some of it was for smaller car manufacturers some were making motorcycles some were making boats There were even a couple of companies uh, I gosh, I, I just spaced the name. I mean, I'll probably remember it at 2 o'clock in the morning or something But there was I know a, a major French company that bought DD on engines almost exclusively and what they did was they built a conversion kit. Uh, like today, if you have a bicycle and you want to make it into a motorcycle, you can buy one of those little 50, you know, 49cc engine kits and convert your bicycle into like a, a moped sort of thing. Well, in the 1890s, there were companies that were actually offering kits to take your horse-drawn carriage or horse-drawn wagon and turn it into a car. You know, you could put... You know, there was a universal kit, you put your gears on, you put your chains on, the motor on, your transmission, which is usually a friction slide plate of some sort, get a steering thing going on, and off you went. Um, so the answer is, we're talking over a thousand cars a year, uh, plus another 10,000 plus in engines, uh, and there were over a dozen companies in 1900 that were producing, you know, at very near that level or just right below it, you know, in the 900 car ranges. Uh, you, there's another uh, almost 100 companies that were producing between 20 and 500 cars-ish uh, at that time. So, yeah, uh, there were obviously a lot of people buying cars. And, and don't forget that there's another industry that's developing around 1900 because by the time you get there, there's now used cars. And, and you have to stop and think about it, that the used car industry didn't exist until there were used cars. And that really didn't start happening until uh, the 1890s. And, and, it's actually, and the used car industry actually plays a role in the development of the vintage car. And so I'll be uh, going into that as well. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, uh, you know, over a thousand cars a year, over 10,000 engines a year. Yeah, they, they got there. Now, I've got another, okay. All right. There's a guy, his name is Spirit Fox MY, and he decided rather than ask me a question, he just threw a shotgun at me. <laughs> Um, so, in fact, he even starts it, you know, about the DD on Bhutan when he starts it off. Oh, so many questions from this one. So, let me just do them one at a time here. His first question is this. Was DD on Bhutan the first manufacturer of steam automobiles? Yes and no. <laughs> I know, great answer. From the time of Richard Trevithick up until about 18, you know, into the 1870s, early 1870s, there had been quite a few individuals who had made their own personal vehicles, as well as some companies that made commercial steam vehicles. I mentioned, I think, in the last Yield Garage, uh, the company uh, Ware Steam Wagon in the 1860s in America that was building, you know, steam wagons, basically trucks. Um, 
but they weren't alone. And I mean, for example, uh, if you're into classical music, uh, Maurice Ravel, the guy who wrote Bolero, his father actually built a steam carriage in 1862. Um, but these were just one-off vehicles. They weren't concerns building, you know, many, many vehicles. Uh, really, the first company to do that outside of the Ware steam engine was a company called Bollet. Uh, and they're getting their own episode soon. In fact, I'm writing it right now. Uh, and there were a number of Bollet companies and Bollet fam mem family members. You know, they're obviously very important. And they were building steam vehicles, you know, as early as 1873. But here's the thing about a car, is that a car is a personal thing. If you buy a car, that's your car. That's not somebody else's car, that's your car. That is your slave. That car is going to do whatever you tell it to do and perform as well as you maintain it. It's yours. Now the thing is, is that the steam carriages that Bollet was building in the 1870s and 1880s were not personal vehicles. These were vehicles like more like buses and coaches. They were designed to be a commercial vehicle where you are going to take this thing, you know, to put on a route and collect fares. And that's not what De Dion was looking for. Uh, De Dion wanted, Albert De Dion, he wanted to have a car, something that was his and he could take it wherever he wanted and it was not an issue, and that's not what Bully was doing. So, in that regard, the answer is yes, D. Dion really was uh, the first to make a steam car. Now, let's get on to more of your questions, Mr. Spirit Fox MY. Uh, question number two uh, Given that they sound like a first mover here, speaking again of D. Dion Baton, why did steam powered automobiles take off? Why did it take the introduction of petrol powered engine to get out the automotive craze started? Okay. Um, Actually, I'm not going to answer that question here, and the reason is simple. Uh, this coming week's, uh, this Saturday's episode uh, is actually going to very much address this particular question, so just stay tuned. Okay, uh, now Mr. Spirit Fox MY has continued his barrage with question number three. What happened to De Dion Bouton? Sounds like they were a major player in the early years, yet you don't hear about DDB SUVs cruising the highways. Okay, hey, fair question. There are going to be more episodes about the company DD and Bhutan. Uh, they had quite a few vehicles uh, that were influential and important, you know, in the vintage area, especially before World War One. Um, but to really answer your question, you know, just sh it, a quick answer would be the Dreyfus Affair happened to uh, D. Dion Bouton. Um, it's generally not a good PR move as the CEO of a company to grab a cane and smack the president of France upside the head. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of, uh, of points from a lot of people and it's going to polarize your company and <laughs> and the company, I mean both uh, Albert D. Dion and uh, George Bouton survived the company because the comp company pretty much was dead by 1932 uh, as far as making cars concerned. I think that they may have actually made bicycles through to the 1950s but as far but they were, they were done with cars by the, uh, by the early 30s. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it, bad PR <laughs> is what really killed it, Didi on Bhutan. But we will have more episodes in the future about them. All right, and now, okay, Spirit Fox MY, here's number four. You see, this is, this is where you're lucky because, you know, if this was maybe six months from now and I actually had a lot of people watching this channel and asking questions, I wouldn't be able to give you this much time. But, you know, hey, take it, enjoy it while you have the vintage era of vintage car history. Number four, you also mentioned electric cars. I have heard a lot of stories about how the electric car was killed off by various industry interests and not necessarily because petrol motors were just better. What's the full story behind the first death of the electric car? Okay, I've heard some of those stories too. They're not true. Um, there's really two things I can say that killed it initially. First is that 
in the late 19th and early 20th century, and keep in mind electric cars didn't really even become available until 1893 in France, and they didn't really become a player until around 1898-ish, you know, in the general marketplace. But the technology at the time for batteries and recharging those batteries is simply unthinkable today. Right now, if you have an electric car, you can charge it up. You can probably get 100 or so miles out of it, go do what you're going to do, plug it in uh, when you're done, and be ready to go the next morning. Not so in the late 19th and early 20th century. The batteries were large, but could still hold enough charge. I mean, you know, you get 40 and 50 miles out of a full charge. The problem was is that it took almost a week to recharge the things. Uh, it, they, they, it was days and days, you know, just to get your charge back up to where you could use the car again. So, unlike a steam car or a gas car, which, you know, you could use and restart every day, not the case with an electric vehicle of that time. So, you could not use it as a daily driver. Uh, and that was a big handicap uh, to the electric cars at the time. And because of that particular handicap, they demographically marketed electric cars to people that, you know, had the money to buy a car, but didn't want to have all of the mess, the grease, the soot, the possibility of breaking your 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 hand up your hand uh, in just getting the thing going, and also didn't need the car as a daily driver, but was it was actually a leisure driver. And so the electric car companies of the late 19th and early 20th century pretty much marketed themselves to wealthy women. Uh, the wives of nobles or of businessmen or, you know, the successful women of the day uh, as being the car for them because they didn't need it every day. Um, and that was going to be the case all the way through to, you know, 1910 and beyond. Uh, the final uh, nail in electric car's coffin was actually the electric motor itself because once you applied an electric starter to a gas engine the major shortcoming of the gas engine was solved and therefore uh, gas powered cars were now just as easy to operate and start as an electric car and didn't have the range issues, didn't take a week to recharge and so the, the, the electric cars were done. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, the story there. But there are going to be quite a few episodes in the future about electric cars. There's a, a lot to talk about, especially the two crazy Frenchmen that tried to get the, the world land speed record in, uh, in the 1890s, but <laughs> that's something else. And here, those are the questions that we have for Yield Garage today. And uh, we will, of course, uh, as uh, the channel grows, we'll have some more. But in any case, I'm Wild Bill, and I'll see you next time. Peace.